You take it, Michael. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Regeneration Podcast. And uh, we were just talking before we went we went live. We were talking about how surreal the the sky in New York, where Mike is in in Michigan, where I am, has been from the the, the fires in in Quebec. Totally surreal, and in upstate New York, I don't know about you, Michael, but the um, a, a couple of years ago we had the ash borer beetle, right? So in addition to this kind of surreal Mad Max type of uh, thing, it says like every third tree is dead. Right. And on the country roads, you might you might go by 200 yards of just dead trees because a certain beetle came yep. in. Yeah, we had that. Killed all, okay. And it's uh, I don't think you uh, our, our guests should just start filming, having anybody do anything. And right. it's going to be a scary movie. Well, I have background is so horrible. And it's cheap. Of our it's a cheap production cost. Yeah. Speaking of our guests, so here's I got a story. I always like I like to start with stories. It bummed me out last week with with Bill Cavanaugh that I was gonna want to ask him to tell me his story, but we didn't have time. Mm. But here's my story. So back in November, right after my mother died, and actually the day after her funeral, I flew to Washington D.C. for a, no, I wouldn't call it a conference. I'd call it a, a colloquium on the brothers Karamazov. And I got there a bit early because my flight got in. I think we were supposed to start at four or five and my flight got in at one. So I had some some time to kill, checked into the hotel. And it happened to be in Georgetown. I said, I'm in Georgetown. I'm going to look for, for the, the exorcist steps. I forgot this is how you guys met. This is yeah. great. Continue. So, so it was only about a half mile from the hotel. And the thing is, so I had it on my GPS, right? Exorcist steps. And I had it on, on the GPS. And I walked past it three times because it's so easy to miss. Because all it is is like it's the it's a vacant parking lot and a, a small vacant parking lot. And then there's the, the exorcist steps, which if you know, uh, those of you who've seen the film, which I think it's probably the scariest film ever made uh the exorcist which came out in 73 we have a rochester mm -hmm. connection the priest when, uh, when the adam priest and i were 11 yeah. so we couldn't see it when it came out we were we could not oh get I, I did see it but we'll come you back did? to that when it came out uh, yeah, we'll come back i to saw that. it a couple years later but i did and it, adam and it knows effed, people it effed me up <laughs> it did but anyway so i go to see these steps and then i go you know then i go back to the hotel and we have dinner and I meet all these people. And one of the people I met there was Adam Simon. And we hit it off from the from the get-go. I mean, we we're like we're like uh you know those kinds of brothers that are that are separated at birth. Having kind of talked to you guys for just a little bit, and I'm not like all new agey, but I would say all of a sudden when I rem I made the connection between the story Michael told me of meeting you, Adam. I the first thought that occurred to me is like the universe needed you to. Oh, to we we felt that for oh, sure. Yeah, 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 we did, yeah, and yeah. It, the and the roots went deep into Detroit and the seventies and the era and the, all these points of references. And wait, we have to celebrate the Exorcist steps and there a addition to our topics here. Oh, she's beautiful. She's beautiful. <laughs> wow. oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, can't talk about uh, you can't talk about horror, and you certainly can't talk about horror in relation to religion, spirituality, Catholicism, especially without talking about the. That's experts. right. And quick you know, little aside. Quick little aside for another show, but Adam, you might watch it. It's a. Uh, I'm a late person who has run a parish, and a uh, case I was brought on to was turned into the last episode ever of a show called Paranormal State. And oh they, right. Yeah, and. Uh, and it's, the episode is called The Devil's Hostage. And I was very involved in it. And they make reference to me and people from the church who kind of came in and backed away. But I'm telling you and all of our listeners, what I experienced there was freaky. And then the, the credits, I think, in this last episode said, when the team from Penn State of paranormal researchers drove away, they all got like attacked in their cars just by like weird. I just believe. Oh, yeah. That. We should it's do a whole show on that. Sometime. You yeah, should. And you should. And on real yeah. stories like that, uh, you know, and they're. <laughs> They're out there. I did do a film, Haunting in Connecticut, that was uh, based on a true story, which doesn't mean everything in it was true. No, right, right, the right, core right, of what happened that. in the present tense was true. I got to kind of invent for those purposes based on interviewing the family that had been involved. Uh, um, you know, what was the haunting about and where it had come from? But it was also interesting how 
the spiritual effect that the events had on the people, especially the mom in that story, who then went on to a, a sort of life of devotion and other things. And it gets to fundamental questions I know we'll discuss about, you know, now, now what's that, going on in these damn things. So, so to back up a little bit, we have to introduce our guest. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So I can, I can introduce it with, hey, who let Adam Simon on the podcast? <laughs> because... Adam, I didn't realize that Adam was a meme, <laughs> but Adam, Adam Simon is a, is a writer, director, producer in Hollywood, uh, known for for many films. But I think a lot of people, like my kids, for instance, know Adam's work from the the series Salem, which was, did that run from twenty seventeen to twenty twenty. Yeah, or 2015 to 2018, or but of course it's streaming, so it's, it's still it's running in perpetuity. Yeah, I've been watching it. It's, it's wonderful, <laughs> and and it is you now. This is one of the things that connected Adam and, and myself when we met in in DC, is that we we started. I think I don't know how we got to the topic. We started talking about John D. Right, and John D. Uh, those of you who don't know, it was a uh, basically uh queen elizabeth's court astrologer and advisor most people think she was the unmentioned brother in the movie greece related to sandra <laughs> that's correct <laughs> yeah that's right Talk, you're, you're getting some esoteric trivia here people yeah. but anyway yeah. so john yeah. d so but john d in uh i wrote a chapter on him in my dissertation because one of john d's things was he was doing a thing called scrying and he hadn't he didn't do the scrying he actually hired a guy to do the scrying which is a kind of being being a medium and they were communicating with spirits and they were trying to recapture the language of adam mm -hmm. so they had mm -hmm. actually and they they had accumulated what they call the enochian alphabet right so which means the the, the alphabet that enoch used and so but what and his his intentions were to uh, at least at first were to try to find a way to heal the rifts in Christendom in Europe between the Catholics and the Protestants, et cetera. You know, and it's thought that he was probably a Catholic priest mm. that who was kind of uh, <laughs> playing it down. And so he went through all these adventures and they were dealing with these spirits who were saying, yeah, we're from God. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, and they kind of got played. We're, we're from that guy who's, uh, you guys think of as God. Yeah, yeah. And they're a little bit lacking in discernment, I think. Yeah, like, he, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> we're him. We're him. We're that guy. We're totally lacking in discernment. And, and, but, but, and you can see how people like when they mess with Ouija boards or stuff like this and and they and they do I mean trust me because I have experience in this way back from in my in my 20s it works it doesn't work for everybody but it works right oh, I won't have and, one of those. and in fact my so if you do that the Ouija board think of this kind of planchette where it kind of you hold your fingers on it and it goes around the board spells things out now my wife knew a girl her, her actually best friend's little younger sister, I wouldn't say little sister, she's probably 14 or 15 at the time. And she would do it and she would sit in front of this board and they were using a wine glass, which a lot of people do for a planchette. Or, or shot glass. the glass moved by itself, right? And I have talked to academics, I've talked to all kinds of people. I said, well, explain me how it will move by itself. Well, there must be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, psychosomatic, you know, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a materialistic explanation. Even the word psychosomatic just begs the next question, right? They do, right? Like, how does this yeah. guy walk on coals? Oh, and, and science so, has an answer. It's psychosomatic. I'm like, and, I don't know. I'm interested in like your scientists, your weirdos, talking to me about like when flesh burns at like what yeah. temperature. Yeah, put that in the comments, mom, mom, yeah. mom, right? <laughs> so, so Adam and I were talking about all this stuff. And then I found out that he was a director and writer of horror. And, and, and that we have basically the same taste in music and interest in Rosicrucianism and interested in a uh, person who I would have loved to have interviewed, but he died was uh, Christopher Bamford. Oh God. Yeah. Good guy. And which in fact, they dedicated, I think was the, was it the last one? Yeah. I think it was the last issue of Jesus imagination was dedicated to Chris. Mm. Um, it was right after he died. So, so welcome to the show, Adam. Thank Simon. you. Yeah, welcome. Thrilled to be here with the two Michaels. Yeah. Right. And we're going to talk about horror and spirituality here today. 
No, so we just Adam. In fact, doesn't isn't do you know Guillermo del Toro? You know, obliquely we we've met. So I mean, enough that by Hollywood rules, I can refer to him as Guillermo. So, so, <laughs> oh, but, you but know Guillermo. My son's a huge fan of him. Guillermo del Toro. And but he has the the original uh, Linda Blair dummy. Yeah, oh, I wouldn't have that thing in my house. You He's got the full size to have the toy, Blair, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's like uh, Spielberg having the uh, rosebud sled, you know. Oh, does he really? Yeah, it's like uh, there's just certain artifacts, you know. I, maybe they'll, we now finally have a museum, the Academy Museum, near where the County Museum is, uh, near the La Brea Tar Pits. And I think they're putting some pressure out there on folks like that to say, hey, it's kind of like the Louvre or something. It's time to, or the British Museum, it's time to maybe put all these things okay. in one place so that everybody can see it rather than just whatever you're doing. Though I suspect in both Guillermo, and I've not met Spielberg, so I won't call him Steven. Uh, that would be so cool if you could. If you wouldn't it, it? You know, who knows what arcane occult practices they are doing with those artifacts to shore up their careers. Or maybe that it can't go to the museum because it's still being used in some, you know, metaphysical way by them might be might be part of it. So so let's ask you, let's start without, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to jump right in, but I think before we jump in, I just want to know how you got to Hollywood from Chicago and how you started writing and directing horror. Wow. Okay. You know, I think the short version would be, well, A, I will, there's a, there's a practical component there and there's a psychic or psychological component and a sort of social component for, for the latter. And I don't usually promote my own work, but one of the handful of things besides Salem in a way um, that I'm particularly proud of is a movie I did for the BBC and the Independent Film Channel. It's a documentary actually called The American Nightmare. You can actually see it. Some some blessed soul has it on YouTube where it gets lives in perpetuity. It's also out there on DVDs and whatnots. But it is a documentary about the American horror film between the years 1968 and 1978, or specifically from Night of the Living Dead to Halloween, which sort of seemed to be the you know, bookends of a very particular period of yeah, horror movies, but are also the years, Michael, that you and I went without giving any away from being, you know, six to 16. And it was kind of my attempt to to actually answer for myself that question of why, as a kid, was I so obsessed with horror? Why did I choose it or why did it choose me? You know, why was, was that the story and movies and imagery and comic books that I was drawn to? And a lot of it, and you see, and, and, and it's really a discussion between me and George Romero, Wes Craven, Toby Hooper, John Carpenter, uh, John Landis, some other, uh, David Cronenberg is in there, talking not about how did they make the movies, but talking about this very question of sort of what, what's in horror and what draws us to it, but particularly about what was happening, especially in America in those 10 years, mm -hmm. you know, from the convention in Chicago and the, 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 the assassinations yep. of King and Kennedy, the younger Kennedy, um, the sexual revolution, all this stuff, and the ways in which that was permeating their work. And it begins, my favorite thing in is that it begins with this montage of imagery from those films and literally images that you would have or that you and I or all three of us would have seen on the television news in that era. And there's times in that where you just can't tell, am I watching a piece of the CBS Nightly News or am I watching Night of the Living Dead? You know, That's what brilliant. is this? Yep. So some part of it was my own seeing that and, and I was from a very I would say politically engaged family and everybody in it was so into the politics of it. and even as a six-year-old I was being dragged to the Grant Park for the for the demonstrations around the the convention and stuff and I was horrified yeah. by that stuff I was like the one who was like I, I found it terrifying I think and I think right. psychically horror was you know was a way of 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 dealing and and processing it and we can come back to that notion of the ways in which no, uh, well, you know let me jump in. So just, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, you and I are exactly the same yeah. age. So I exactly? always exactly. Yes. No, we, I don't think our birthdays are the same. Oh, we, okay. Yeah. I just called you out and I won. Damn but, close. But same I, year. Always, I always tell my students, you know, I said, you know, people my age are, were basically traumatized by the assassinations of King and Bobby Kennedy, which is 68, right? Yeah. A couple months apart. Yeah. And, uh, and, and what happened in Chicago in 68, which in fact, I think the MC5 even yes. that, right? Yes. 
Yes. In fact, and that I, imagery of like to see the very forces on the one hand, to see the forces of order exemplified by the by the cops, especially in Chicago, you know, with their batons out and, and beating people or my father getting hit in the head or seeing police in the south with their savage dogs being set upon, you know, students and black yep. you know, people doing sit ins. Or I remember the shock as a kid of seeing soldiers and 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 tanks not tanks but troop carriers running through the streets in chicago or or guys literally behind guns on the top of the field museum and stuff yeah. like that because of what they thought might be happening i mean there's a right. bit of that now but nothing quite as traumatic and chaotic as that and that was the the thing is then we would also tell me if this you this was your experience so i would get up i don't know quarter till seven some days during the week and the cartoon started at seven so I turned the TV on because that's the first thing you did when you were a kid in the 1960s. <laughs> and then, but they would usually right before the cartoons came on, it was the news and they would be giving the death counts and the missing in action counts from right. Vietnam. That's right. Right. Which uh, that would, to me, that seemed like a much more immediate experience than even we hear about, you know, deaths in Iraq or Afghanistan or anything now. It's very much at a remove now, even though we have the internet. That seems so much more immediate. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, if you're six or seven or eight years old and you're watching it before the cartoons, that's kind of traumatizing. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, look, we don't get into the politics of it, but there's no doubt that the military learned they're, they're never, we're never going to have a war where we allow the press to move as freely as they did. Right. In that war, you know, it was really, you know, quite exact. I mean, it had always been that way. And then if you're willing to risk your life and, and instead, remember, starting with the Iraq one, it became like, no, you have to be officially embedded with them and, mm -hmm. and vetted what they're doing. No, you're absolutely right. And that that montage and American nightmare, it wasn't just that we were hearing body counts. We were seeing body bags. They would actually yeah. seeing it, you know, in your, in your black and white TV or even if you had a color TV, the news was still in black and white often yep. and the footage they would use. So that was all over there, you know. The, the short answer is the rest of that is just that, you know, via that, and I think the, the comfort and pleasure and fascination I found with film in at that, I mean, also one of the things that was happening when, in that era in the late 60s and early 70s was for reasons we don't have to go into, but just to remind young folks watching this, this is an era when there's no streaming, there's no DVD, or even the VHS we later had. There's not even any cable TV. There's a handful of TV channels and then some fuzzy ones you can barely get that aren't the networks. Yep. And movies and TV back then were not only different industries, they were competing industries rather than being the one industry that for the most part they are now. So because of that, you were not a lot of films you were just not seeing uh, on television or you'd see it when it was out in the theater, it'd circulate and then it'd be gone. But then you would... If you were lucky, there was a period as it was when we were there, when all these old movies from the 30s and 40s were actually coming back into theaters, Frankenstein, Dracula, The Wolfman, and they were released into TV for the first time since they'd been made yep. back in the early part of the century. So I was sort of inundated with that old Hollywood culture. And my parents being of that age, that's we would see that and, and see lots of that. So for whatever reason, I definitely was one of those peculiar kids who just thought from the get go, right, that's that's what I got to do you know, and had the little wind up eight millimeter camera and a little editing set and would cut up the little Super 8 movies. Or if you really loved a movie, you might be able to get a little Super 8 version of Frank yeah, and remember that. like eight minutes of it. You could play on your own projector and stuff. So no, one way or another, I was actually determined from a kind of ridiculously young age that I would do what I ended up doing. It, it hasn't been any of the, the fantasies I had about it. It's obviously been very different. And in particular, you know, I've ended up doing a lot more writing than directing or writing and producing than directing, you know, due to the just vicissitudes of life. But and not to mention after 20 years of film, kind of finding my way into television, which is something I would never have imagined back then because TV was crap and movies were cool. Of course, yeah. now it's kind of the reverse. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's the that's the, the short of it. But I was definitely it was, it, it, you know, as 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 the other Michael said before, it definitely felt like an element of, of I don't know what you want to. You want to say it's a calling or was it destiny? It was just like, oh, yeah, of course, that was what I was going to do. And even the first time that I finally got out here in the mid 80s after college, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally at home here. This is where I'm this was where I was supposed to be. Yeah, good. Fascinating. Good. Now, <clears throat> that's. Uh, 
yeah you know, I, I i so i mean you know i'm just gonna go down nostalgia you know rem memory lane and nostalgia right now because the the opposite of that the horrors we watched on television with vietnam and the, and the assassination of king and bobby kennedy uh was i don't know if, did you watch this because i did and i was probably only well we had to be only five years old but when the beatles did all you need is love on television did you see that what yeah you? i did i was it had a much bigger impact on my eldest brother and the middle brother because i was sort of yeah. too young but they always would still tell those stories and i would certainly have been there you remember the ed sullivan appearance not the ed sullivan one. Oh no, no this is when they did all you need is love oh, oh, oh much later no that one yes i know what you're saying yes the, the, that, the late well, 60s Detroit, right? that was about five o'clock in the afternoon yeah so it was probably four o'clock in, in chicago <laughs> And my mother made me watch it because it was like, this is a technological marvel. That's right. The Beatles. But but that was the that was the other thing that was percolating. So that, it was like that was like the moon landing. I mean, that that you're right. That was the pop cultural equivalent of an and an attempt to kind of make peace. Yeah. And, 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 well, and the moon landing too, kind of right? Thing. Yeah. The, so yeah, I remember going to my aunt's house to watch the moon landing because it was like one or two in the morning. And I was I mean, 10 maybe or whatever I was. <laughs> And we could bar barely stay awake, but we saw it. We witnessed his history. Of course, um, we either witnessed history or we witnessed uh, one of, uh, what's his name? Kubrick. You know, the Shining guy. Oh, Kubrick. Kubrick's Kubrick, Kubrick, best Kubrick, movies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. There is to that. I did have to, I did have a, a, a five years ago with my, my son, who's now six, about to be 17 in a few months, but this would have been a few years ago when he watched that documentary or watch something on YouTube about that. And I'm like, he's like, dad, you, you, they were never on the moon. I'm like, no, no, dude, we were, they were definitely on the moon. It's like, no, 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 it was Stanley Kubrick. It was, it was this, it was this, it was this. He he now acknowledges that he, he believes we probably were on the moon, but it, so it, that's it, a certain, the idea that, that Kubrick thing, directed. That whole thing comes from like one, one video. Cause I'm aware, like I've, one of my sons will say, dad, if you want to go down that one, it can be very convincing. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah. But is you, that you, based you, on one famous video on YouTube? Who know, yeah, who knows? I mean, or he would have seen a, one about that or okay, yeah. and then there was a similar, there was a long and pretty fascinating examination of it via this film about the whole subculture that's grown up around The Shining and the idea that The Shining is filled with esoteric clues to the issues about the moon landing and that oh, really? is doing, you know, look, it's the glory <laughs> and misery of the very loss of what Michael was talking about of this this sort of centralized media culture that we still had in the mid and later 20th century that was for better and for worse, this enormously unifying thing. And yes, it was also predicated on suppressing all kinds of more anarchic, you know, kinds of ideas and voices that were never going to get heard on ABC, CBS or NBC or on a big Hollywood screen. Um, and, but we now kind of have the opposite of that, of course, where we only have the rhizome of like, there's a giant hollow in the center where there's very little, you know, centralized uh, curated culture that instead, no, the, 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 the edges, the periphery is the yeah. center. Now, you know? It's interesting because there, there was a legit underground back in the Yeah, world. exactly. So, I don't know, you probably did this too. So, so, so the, is that the same thing as saying there was a legit party of dissent? You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to be serious. Yeah, so. yes. yeah, yeah. I think it's very like it's the absolutely. left used to be a party of the dissent. We just don't have one. Okay. But, uh, so, for instance, counterculture. I'm thinking. So, so when the the Exorcist came out, I was 11, and I couldn't see it because there's no way there was no way in hell my mother was like let me let me see that movie. And but so I waited a couple of years till it was at the Dollar Theater, <laughs> and I didn't That's tell right. her. The good old Dollar Theater. And, and it traumatized me, and I was still. 14 or whatever but 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 the thing is though in those days you could there was an alternative alternative cinema that was out there that you could find i mean it was like the, it was really underground stuff and they would remember what was the kind of movies we saw like like frank zappa's 200 motels or oh, absolutely uh, yeah or even before or even a boy first... and his dog or, oh boy and his dog absolutely and eraser head a little bit later Eraserhead. And Rocky Horror was probably one of the ones that was. And I, and I saw those. Yes, yeah. is it cheating? Absolutely. For a dollar. Though, though it, a lot of people who couldn't at our age who couldn't see The Exorcist, they could at least 
get the copy of Mad Magazine that had the Mad Magazine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't think of the number of movies as to this day I've never seen grown up movies from that era like Bob Carroll, Ted and Alice, but I can still picture the Mad Magazine parody of those. Yeah, <laughs> I can. Even, there even like, like a decade later, to a certain extent, right. absolutely. Yeah. You know, but there, look, there's a, there's a, not just a party of dissent, as you're saying, Michael, but a whole culture of dissent coming out of really the 50s, which, you know, we receive as having been the era of max conformity, which in some ways it might have been. But at the same time, it was also the beginnings of what would become the counterculture you're talking about and all those things. And, and I have to admit, as someone raised, I think at our age, like we were, we were like the, the giant wave of that that had risen up literally from the underground up. And we were like surfers on the, the kind of as that was hitting the shore, really, in the late 60s and early 70s. But I do look back and it's funny because there's that part of me, maybe it's the cranky old guy in me. It's like, that's all the stuff I love. And I love the dissent and I love the craziness of it and the radicalism of it. And I love all the things that were marginal culture then, horror movies and comic yep. books and all really? the weird stuff, all that stuff. And and if you, and the authors that we loved, an H.P. Lovecraft or a Philip K. Dick, that was like a secret handshake between people yep. who knew who these people were. And if you'd said to me then at say age 12 or 13 or 14 or 15, oh no, that's going to become the center of the culture that, you know, Philip K. Dick and H.P. Lovecraft will be in the official library of America and horror movies will be something everybody watches. And, and guess what? Those, those ratty comic books that your parents don't really want you reading are going to be the biggest movies and the main thing that people see. I would be like, there's no way that's ever going to happen. And there's a big part of it. It's like, ah, I kind of wish it hadn't. Happened. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not sure what the happened. consequences of that are. You know, was the way it happened, happened. right? Yeah. It was the way it happened. So, so to to move into our theme then mm. of spirituality and horror, and I was thinking after you mentioned that when I, we talked on the phone last week, I've been thinking about it a lot. I mean, can horror exist without religion? Hmm. Hmm. You know, I, there's a few ways into that. Yeah, I was thinking about it after our conversation too. And 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 let me offer you a couple stories, myths, parables, if you want. You know, on that. And and and, and then we can talk about the actual kind of histories and genres of that, et cetera. But one is simply this, and and I think Bamford, wherever he is, Chris. Chris would have seen it this way. You know, and it, by the way, it's interesting how much Chris was his early formation was as what we used to call a cinephile. Yeah. He literally was the head of the Calle de Cinema cinephile group in Dublin or wherever he was in Ireland as a as a young man and, and the programmer of the movie theater. And, and it, there is something just with cinema itself that is related to the kind of things that Chris would then devote his life to, I think, that are very related. And I, and I think from even the fragmentary conversations he and I had, particularly I was telling him about, inspired by him, how I had used uh, uh, the grail music from Wagner in this film about Sam Fuller. And anyway, because it was a director he loved. So here's the little parable that I, I channeling Chris that I think we would say there, there was a way of thinking once upon a time that was at the center of our culture that literally you can't even say it was at the center of our culture. It was our culture, a, a different way of understanding the relation between the visible and the invisible, a different way of understanding that would make the kind of distinctions we take for granted, like between the material and the spiritual, and maybe wouldn't even have understood those kinds of separations or, or distinctions. Um, and over time and over history in our culture, that stream, that worldview moves out of the center. It gets concretized and kind of shoved out of the actual center of culture into and it gets shoved even out of religion, arguably, or out of institutionalized yeah. religion, right? And and gets shoved initially into the welcoming arms of, of art, particularly in the Romantic era, that all these things that aren't going to be talked about anymore, even at the pulpit, let alone in the universities or or in popular culture, get, get kind of taken up by artists and people thinking about the function of art, you know. And then something happens where even within the realm of art, where this was this culture is still being held and nourished, it kind of gets kicked out of the center of art in the name of realism, in the name of social relevance, in the name of all kinds of things, psychological uh, truths, et cetera. And it kind of gets moved to the margins even of art into kind of the, uh, you know, the alleyways of genres like horror fiction, 
like science fiction, like all this sort of stuff. So there's a sense where I feel like these, what were once upon a time, the big fundamental truths that would be trumpeted throughout that would have been ringing like the bells in the center of town have kind of ended up hiding in the gutters of culture, in, mm-hmm. in effect, if you, under, if you know what I mean. And so we shouldn't be surprised that, that that's where we found it. And, and, I, and I even sometimes think the reason why those gutter genres, whether those be comic books or science fiction or horror or mystery, I mean, think about the fact that we even call a whole genre mystery and all the things mystery has meant for us, you know, the reasons those have flooded back into the center of our culture bespeaks the, the hunger for that fundamental understanding of the world that got banished there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, gotcha. So I think that's a, that's the big answer of like how, how, yeah. how did that end up being in horror because it wasn't anywhere else it was like the one place you could talk about these things and you could yeah. suggest those things now for the most part obviously in horror it tends to be viewed as horrific the encounter with the invisible is not a nice thing generally but not always so within ghost stories and others there is also some sense of the numinous and all there but and you can see it was it Rudolf Otto or one of the great theologian yeah. who talks about the you know that holy. that sort of mm-hmm. idea of the holy or movie kinds of terms you know so it doesn't surprise me now that said i don't throw out one other thing you know genre when i was a kid i used to i loved all the genres i used to imagine if you could do and i would try to do it as a kid i'd draw try to draw a map of genre world like where's horror versus you know where's science fiction and where's crime fiction where's the western and all those and horror is a big capacious genre if you think of someone like poe who arguably is one of the inventors of it even though the word's not used and no one's calling it a genre because on the one hand he's writing stories that are basically crime stories right whether they're mysteries detective mysteries that will inspire sherlock holmes or whether they're kind of almost more like serial killer stories or slasher stories but that again are about human villains doing horrible things and then on the other hand he had stories that are about supernatural visitations and and cosmic metaphysical journeys into the supernatural. So it contains both. But I think the horror that we're talking about really is that kind that touches on the invisible, as it were. I think it's brilliant. You know, and Adam, the uh, I'm with you. Like that was that was honestly the best five minute <laughs> summation of it. I mean, it's, it's, I really, really think it was awesome. Uh, worth the price of admission. Is this. <laughs> and then, uh, though I'm with you guys in sympathy, but when Michael, when you asked about is horror intimately connected to religion, I was thinking of, uh, and I looked it up at work today too, not knowing this would come up, but it was a, an article you had mentioned Mad Magazine, Adam. This was an article in Cracked Mag. <laughs> maybe 15 years ago, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. It said that vampire movies, vampire movies are, you know, regnant under liberal regimes and zombie movies are regnant under conservative regimes. And oh. it just breaks it all down politically. You know that- Oh, I got to see um, that. You got to send me that. That's- Oh, that's, yeah, that's yeah. It. Because like, think when you think of Dracula, the yeah. con- when you have a liberal running the country, we're worried about gender bending. We're worried about immoral sexual behavior. We're worried about foreigners and we're worried about parasites, like the parasitic nanny yes, state. That's and so then, right. Yep. And then zombies, the left thinks the right are zombies when you have conservatives. So those movies, and they did the only cool thing. Well, there's a lot cool, but the coolest thing about this article was a chart that oh had God. the correspondences were were 100 percent true. And then I have a theory. So, and then for zombies, the basic theory was that the liberals, uh, when there's a conservative in control, the liberals, uh, you know, mindless consumers, the conservatives are all mindless consumers. They're dumb, of course, right? Um, the liberals see the conservatives as so dumb. And the liberals are worried about the zombies wanting to stamp out, you know, all nonconformists and things like that. But I have a feeling now, because I, I think I see even under a liberal administration, zombie movies are still regnant. And I think it's just because the technocracy, <laughs> which both the the left and the right have a hand in creating, yeah. <laughs> the, the notion of zombies is bigger. We all see ourselves it as is. like walking in a dead world. Yeah. Look, that's I got to see that article because I'm okay. and, and Michael, I'm going to make sure you're there. In fact, both Michael should come. I'm going to do later next year, like next spring, another Liberty Fund conference on literally almost that theme. But you know, on in particular, I'm, it's going to be a two parter. I think the first part being on kind of liberalism's monsters because it's not just I think, as you're saying, Michael, and as the article is suggesting about what under such regimes people are afraid of, but it's also about what liberal regimes themselves are afraid of or recognize as kind of 
you know, the Freudian term, and it's got relevance, even if we think a lot of Freud is bunk, this idea of the return of the repressed, yes, you know, what, sure. what even in your mind is kind of not thinkable, you know, will come back as, as a kind of uncanny creature. And if you even look at, you know, the sequence that goes really from Frankenstein, but not so much the original novel as its revival on the stage in the 19th century, later in the 19th century, I mean, it's written obviously in the, at the, at the, passage from the 18th to the 19th century. But then there's about a 10 year period right around the time that gets revived and becomes the popular thing we think of it as. I mean, the book was always known, but it became a kind of pop culture phenomenon, you know, 50, 60 years after it was published when it got put on stage in a much simplified form. And within the 10 years of that, you get Dracula, Jekyll and Hyde, uh, the werewolf, the mummy, Basically, all what we think of as the canonical monsters are all... Well, Frankenstein, created. right? Say it again? Frankenstein, you know, the subtitle, The Modern Prometheus. The Modern Prometheus, absolutely. Yeah. Now, and we could get into the politics of what she's dealing with there, mm -hmm. and I think her own terror of... Or the, the biography, sure, the background. Well, it's it's all the biography, the, the fact she's, you know, born in the blood of her mother's death in that bloody bed, and the, the, the baby she lost right before she wrote it. But also, I think the terror with which she viewed and love with which she viewed uh, her husband, Percy Shelley, her father, William Godwin, and even Byron, and these crazy radicals around her, and this kind of fear she had about their attempts to kind of rebuild and make a new man or a new world. Yeah. But Remember, there's something yeah. about this 10-year period in England at the height of what, what really was liberal England, in the true sense of the word of, you know, the liberal parties and stuff, that they imagined all the monsters that are pretty much still there, yeah. And if you actually look at those stories, they they exemplify each one of the things they were most afraid of. Down to Dracula is still a great read to this day. And so mm -hmm. it's a really fantastic and innovative book. But, you know, who is it who ultimately is able to destroy Dracula in that? It's the ultimate kind of, to some extent, liberal in that sense, dream of I think it's a real estate guy, a scientist, a cowboy, you know, and a, and a banker or something. I mean, it's like the forces of of liberal institutions that have to seek out this undead aristocrat who's sucking the blood of the city. Yeah. The, the only thing I would say about the zombie thing is what that misses is ghosts. Because in, in my yeah, template yeah, yeah. of that, the conservative monster is par excellence is the ghost. But the zombie is very- Say more about the ghost. Say more about the ghost. Well, I mean, we could talk forever about that. I mean, when I was doing Salem, one of the reasons I wanted to do Salem was I was trying to figure out like, what are the monsters or the fears that are truly universal, like that exist in every culture, every tribe, every nation, every civilization on earth. And there's actually very few. Most of them can be collapsed in together. And the biggest ones are some version of the walking dead, either in their spectral form as a ghost or in something we would call a zombie that is in some more palpable material form. And we could, trust me, I could go off forever on sure, sure. terminology and stuff around that. Um, and the other most fundamental one was kind of the witch, actually, both male and female. And most of these other things like vampires and werewolves are derivations of kind of or combinations of <clears throat> one or the other. But even within that, the distinction I would see there is that, look, if, if conservatism then and now, for better and for worse, um, is founded on ideas about tradition and about the past, then what's fearful even within those who think that, let alone those who might be afraid of that, is precisely the dead hand of the past or the idea that things from the tradition are not dead and might come back in, 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 in problematic ways versus in a liberal regime where the fears are precisely as you're saying, Michael, oh, the blowback of empire, um, immigration, um, contagion, uh, women with new rights, all the things, and potentially another vision of the dead hand of the past in the form of sort of blood sucking aristocrats, you know, who, who, who might actually be secretly spreading syphilis. <laughs> like the world blood. economic forum. Might exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but by the way, but, one other thing I got to throw out there about the religion thing, the, on a practical level, you cannot underestimate, especially with this, an audience that's pretty informed on Catholicism and understanding that realm, a lot of what we have physically as horror, especially American and in British horror, literally derives from anti-Catholic propaganda. You know, the earliest bestsellers in America are books like The Confessions of Maria Monk and this kind of terror of what's really going on in those. Right. And that's right. now that's been transmuted over our time to like, we still have all those fears, but now we still need the priest to come in with his suitcase 
to yeah, banish yeah. these things, right? And could you call anti-Catholicism in that statement just another form of enlightenment thinking? You know, how how much of an overlap on a Venn diagram? It's a it's there? a good it's a good question. I'm looking into some of this now because I'm doing a conference in November on the kind of the the history of, of paranoia and conspiracy thinking in America from before the, from the Puritans to Q, as it were. And there's no doubt that in the 19th century there's this explosion that's often very contradictory of like terror of Catholics, but also terror of Masons, uh, terror of Jews, terror of immigrants, all these different things. So there's some elements of that. I, I think at its core, yes, in the sense that what is the, the light of the Enlightenment Some was contrasted. And look, we all know, especially sitting here, how much a, a caricatured version of the Middle Ages and of the Catholic worldview, uh, when it didn't have to even call itself Catholic, was the product of that Enlightenment view that, sure. no, it's this dark you know, uh, it just seems to me that like, the, the anti-Catholicism could be the um, the idea. Again, it's what I think maybe is a theme of the show, too. You know, when we talk about um, Ari Man versus Sophia, it's the notion of mm -hmm. man as a machine versus, you know, so it's the, it's the same argument we're having now with transgenderism is well, man yeah, a machine yeah. where you can rearrange the parts. Right. And yep. yep. And I think Adam points to something when he's talking about, you know, Byron and Mary Shelley and sure. What's his name? Polydori. When they were when they were coming up, up up with all these monsters, that was in a way the shadow side of of romanticism. Right? Yes, it yes. was the dark side of romanticism. Say more yes. about that. Well, in romanticism, you know, if you read Wordsworth or even yeah, okay. Shelley in his better moments, right? It's optimistic, idealistic. It's hopeful, mm -hmm. but and that's I mean, Mary Shelley, <laughs> Percy's wife, wrote Frankenstein. Right. Oh, yeah. So well, there's picture a that shadow painting. of it at the same picture time. That painting the. I mean, there's a the dark romanticism is an important phrase, and 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 I think we repress a lot of that side of it. But that side by side with those first lyrical ballads of Wordsworth's are what are basically horror poems by Coleridge. Yep. Right. About okay. a vampire lady. Uh, uh. About the dead hand of the of the ancient mariner. So he's already getting that. And I'm reading a wonderful book that's sort of a biography of this guy Joseph Josephson, who was the publisher of lots of these folks including Godwin and Wollstonecraft and, and, and Wordsworth and others. And his best friend was this guy, Henry Fuseli, the painter. And he actually had the original, the first version that Fuseli painted of The Nightmare. Have you ever seen that? You've probably seen yeah. that painting. A woman yeah. on a bed with this weird squatting gnome on her. And there's yeah. vaguely in the background this vision of a horse's head straight really out of creepy. Godfather. Yeah. Right. right. It's a famous painting. But in that era, that single painting was pointed to more often than almost any other image as being the emblem of romanticism. Yeah. So the night they were more aware than we are now that the nightmare was right at the center, that the yeah. minute you were going to open those doors to everything they were busy that had been being shut down, uh, they, you know, scary things will come through too. Isn't that, that's a funny thing. Cause when we began and I forget exactly what I'm tying it to, but I think in the first five minutes of this podcast, Adam, I wanted to say that, you know, when we're talking about the repressed, there's a big thing, you know, having counseled students for like 30 years, that great that you think you're going to open. It's always, I tell people, it's, it's it's more bang for its buck. It's pretty, it's pretty scary early on, but open that thing. It's just something that wants to be loved. Right. right. But, um, you know, and then you see one of the things that interests me in what you're talking about is over the years, I don't think I watch as much horror, but I've read some on horrors because I didn't want to keep my four kids. I didn't necessarily want to keep him away from it, but I showed him an old good va vampire movie one time and they were so freaked out. <laughs> yeah, it was already too much. You should have started yeah, with yeah. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. That's you know, right. That, no, that's, that's, that's the one you always start with, right? But you have some people, you know, when you read the the some of the the takes and you're you're much more nuanced, Adam, some people would say that horror is because of repressed sexual desire and other people would say it's because of repressed sexual morality, right? Yeah, you right. So Halloween is repressed sexual morality. It's, it, have, it's, have yeah, it's both, though. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's, not, it's, 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 it's the cake and the eating it, too. I mean, I there's agree a great moment, you. actually, in The American Nightmare, where we're talking with Cronenberg, who, who's very much talking and thinking about the sexual revolution. And he's talking about his earliest films, which are all about kind of what are, is clearly sexual contagion. But he also starts talking spontaneously, you know, in the film about its relation that that's also about the transmission of any idea that's going to liberate and change everything and how that's going to be true, terrifying. True, and yeah. it can, almost all these things can always look any, as you guys know better than anybody, any, any kind of dualism is always ripe. Any kind of Manichaeanism is always ripe for being read backwards or forwards. Right. 
and it's an invasion of the body snatchers. You know, oh wait, are the body snatchers the communists, and we got to wonder where they're coming, or the body snatchers the McCarthyites who are going yeah. yeah, this way? It's the, that, that's it's in the nature structurally almost of that that kind of thinking. But on this question of like young people and it is two things I think people should think about, especially if they've got kids and wondering about it. On the one hand, horror is mostly a self-selecting genre. That was my experience. Yeah. And I think those who don't want it, don't, who don't need it, don't find it and don't want it. Other than every once in a while when there's the big horror movie everybody sees and everybody can go and laugh. But I think those that need it, and for those that need it, I view it as literally a kind of homeopathic medicine. Yep. You know, a little bit of what ails you will cure you. Right? Therapy, sure. Well, or Wes Craven has a great phrase he uses in the American Nightmare where he says it's boot camp for the psyche. It's car- catharsis, right? It yeah. is yeah. catharsis. And I guess the way I look at that, I've had friends say to me, oh, well, you know, you let your kids see certain things. I say, well, A, I let them see some and, and I, I don't police them perhaps as much as I should in terms of what they find in their own, in part because in the same way that we all want them to run around in the world yeah. and have some encounter with it. And I don't want to be helicoptering around them. I, Good I came to this thought. I came to this thought that look, your kids are going to have nightmares. Kids are going to have nightmares whether they see some scary or not. But particularly if they do see some scary stories, they will. I say the nightmare is a skin knee of the psyche. Yeah. And if you and if your kid's coming back with too many skin knees and is bleeding all the time, then they're doing you're doing something wrong. But if they never have a skin knee, then you're also doing something wrong. Yep. You know, I'm smiling. I'm getting out of interjection. And I'm smiling because your least diner expect. said, uh, but. The um, I have a daughter who had night terrors. I tell you how terrifying mm. though. You're running around the house. She would just run to me, look in my eyes, and I could tell she wasn't recognizing me. But you're 100 right that all they're going to have nightmares. But I profited a lot for Lucy on uh, Rudolf Steiner, who at least conjectured that like a dream of Medusa was an upset belly. <laughs> so that, so that <laughs> I I didn't allow my daughter to watch TV just for overexposure. She's a sensate, yeah. like an endomorph. So yeah. I wouldn't let her watch TV and I wouldn't allow her spicy food after five o'clock and all the nightmares. <laughs> and I did it. Well, Steiner is brilliant on those things. It's funny. I, I, as Michael knows, I have a lot of friends in that community. I've got tons of respect and love to read and often get the same thrill of strangeness from reading some Steiner that I might from reading to make me love crap because it's such a strange and cosmic vision. But of course, in some of his lectures, he's very suspicious about cinema, period. It's right. Like, yeah. And and there's the idea that it, it, it will functionally I'm, I'm, I'm caricaturizing it, but that it will poke holes in your etheric body, in effect, because it will replace the memories of lived experience. And you'll be carrying these memories of unlived experience. And I often think it's a beautiful image and metaphor and one that actually tells us a lot about how powerful all images and stories, but especially the, the flickering images of, of cinema really do somehow penetrate our souls. In they ways do. that become like memories, and that there's because, some truth there. And part of that is because, uh, just like with he didn't like, you know, dolls that were too finished either, right? Right. Yeah, and the, right. the idea with that is that that's like the, every the imagination doesn't ever. have much work to do, so it's completely passive. <laughs> it's like right? Jason's mask. It's like, uh, yeah, I did. It's is true. that a true connection? You think? Well, and he's also is the uncanny. That's true. I, you know, I have some here. Some it's yeah. and, and here's a good example of what Michael's talking about. So he, these are some. Waldorf, you've seen them before, I'm sure. These are like Waldorf produced. I have those toys, you know, yeah. made in I Germany. Like they make me feel good. I feel right, good and they make soul. me feel good too. Yeah. And these yeah. ones are, and it is true that if you contrast that with, say, now you're show with me a more literal yeah. image of Mary, uh, oh. you know, yeah, I don't want to live in a world only this, but the idea that, yes, at certain stages of life, this is how we would apprehend something that if we saw that too soon yeah. might actually be terrifying or shut your eyes to something you know what if you showed us freaky exorcist doll girl again <laughs> or let alone <laughs> yes if you were to show that <laughs> it's funny this that movie that like you michael that was the trauma i think all the traumas of my life in that era the politics divorce the crime in the streets all connected to that movie yeah, Which, unlike you, you I was brought way, to yeah. like opening weekend in Chicago because my you really? family you was eleven. Come. At eleven, and they knew they thought, oh, he likes horror movies. That'll be okay. But I, here's the thing: I didn't realize it was a horror movie. And part of the thing about horror, for those of us who even as kids loved it, is you kind of prepare yourself, right? You're ready for it. You know the news. And I can still remember standing in line, this huge line. I think it was at the Chicago Theater, downtown Chicago, around the block to get in. It's, it's not opening night, but it's that first weekend. And everybody's there, and there's clearly all this palpable excitement. I turned to my older brother, who was 
older and smarter as he still is than me. And I said, what is this movie? Because I hadn't heard about it. It wasn't in Famous Monsters. I hadn't read anything about this. He says, he, he very sage, he said, it's a crime movie. It's about blackmail. Like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> he had misread it as The Extortionist. Oh, that's too funny. That's so funny. I was going in there thinking I was about to see one of those crime movies that I didn't quite understand that my folks like. And instead, next thing you know, you know, her head's turning around and I'm like, that's right. And they were, and they remember when that first came out, they handed out barf bags. Barf, the old barf bags. Wow. If there's, a, if there's an equivalent now, and again, it, 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 for my money, it's one of, if not the greatest horror film of the last couple of decades. And the only one that to me comes close to the traumatic power of The Exorcist. And this is not a recommendation because I would say it, it literally is a, a potentially traumatic film. Not, I don't know what you're going to say. This is great. Yeah. Uh, hereditary. You heard the film by Ari Aster. He did. Two, he's done two. I guess his third film just came out, but his first two films were both horror films that he wrote and directed. Both brilliant, very different. I, I highly recommend them both. Though the first yeah. of them, Hereditary, is so emotionally disturbing and really, and yet it also deals with the spiritual and all kinds of stuff and family and gender and a zillion things. And then he followed it up with a film called Midsommar, kind of a folk horror film about. Uh, uh, some American grad students who end up going to this obscure place in Sweden, this obscure oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Community, community in Sweden. Yeah. Which is a wonderful oh, yeah. film. Also. People have been telling me to see that. I haven't had it. It's great. Uh, it's great. It's a little easier to take than hereditary, but hereditary taps into it's that, that trifecta of like family horror, spiritual horror, psychological horror, body horror. I mean, come on. You know, if we could look at the inside of our own bodies, this is what Cronenberg always teaches us, right? I mean, we are beings of horror with this beautiful exterior. But if I was to open up my chest and show you what it looks like inside, unless you're a doctor or some kind of a freak, that's horror. That's horrific. That is literally body horror, let alone the reality of our own mortality. I mean, yeah. interesting i could do a lot with that thinking about it just thinking out loud briefly it's going to be insane is that like rudolf steiner and we're not pure steinerites by the way it's no, probably, I I've probably mentioned him five times total but, i know well you know, he, when he talks about social threefolding he's saying you know that like when you first look at a human body you don't see these distinctions between the circulatory system the endocrine system you know and the nervous system but is there a sense, Adam, thinking with me along this, if what you're saying is you open the human body and you don't know what it is, that's horror. You know, this notion that we look at the world and we see the overlaps between the economics and politics, you know, and how what we call political economy with our guest a couple of weeks ago, Eugene McCarraher, you know, how politics influences money or even the role of political murder. But that whole thing is horror, you know. Well, look, it, there's a moment in, I don't know if you know the Cronenberg film, uh, Dead Ringers. Um, only heard of it yeah. it's brilliant quite disturbing but he's one of the great artists you know who again came out of this ghetto as it were of the the genre and there's a moment when and the perform the lead performance by a i'm blanking on his name is such a great actor plays these twin brother gynecologist surgeons um and one of them has this sort of almost throwaway line about how we're obsessed with the beauty of the body especially women's bodies um but really we should have beauty contests for the most perfect organs inside. He starts talking about the beauty of the internal body. And as typical with Cronenberg, it's, it's a two edged thing of like, on the one hand, this guy's insane and it's a horror film. And on the other hand, he's telling you some truths. And part of what I understand about what you're saying about kind of the, the Steinerian view and a more kind of broadly theosophical, anthroposophical, or just philosophical view would be, this is the veil over it, and it is a veil of beauty for the most part. If you open it up, the first stage, not understanding what you're seeing, would be horror, both because it looks grotesque, but also because it would remind us of what we fear is the horror that awaits us at the end of a material existence. But certainly, the more you understood what you were seeing, you could imagine that if you could stare into that long enough while learning and understanding, the intricate, infinite beauty and brilliance with which the body somehow was designed and works, that that horror might well transmute into some sense of the beautiful and the holy. Right. 
So, so it sounds like you just wrote a textbook on theodicy, Adam. Yeah, no kidding. Uh oh. <laughs> so let me, let me move over. So what are we in? Well, it's, it's excellent, but you're so, so let's right. Move over I mean, the to, let's move over to so Salem. Hmm. I mean, I was when I was thinking about you were talking about the different kinds of horror. Would we would you call Salem a kind of Protestant horror? <laughs> Well, it's dealing with Protestant question. culture, yeah. right? It's dealing yeah. with Protestant culture, yeah. pure Puritan culture. Bad. Well, I mean, it's tricky because witches do penetrate so deeply, and we could spend we could do a two hour, ten hour podcast just on all the different meanings and legacies of of, of thinking about witches and what they meant. Um, certainly, yes, in the sense that I wanted to. I had always been. Is it Protestant or yes? And in the in the same line as H.P. Lovecraft, right? Right. Yeah. But equally in the same line as it's like also American, Haw- right? It's American. Yes. Nathaniel Hawthorne. Yeah. And then before that, Poe. And before that, a guy that's kind of forgotten today, but who was the first best selling American writer, Charles Brockton Brown, who wrote kind of gothic novels at the turn of the 18th and 19th century. There is that uh there there is that stream. And that I think is I almost want to say it's uniquely American in a way, and is in the same way that there's a certain American kind of Catholic horror and or horror of yeah. Catholicism, that, that those are inside there are linked. Um, and you can see, I, I just have been rereading some of these really seminal Hawthorne stories, like the the Minister's Black Veil or whatever yeah, yeah. it's called. I mean, it's a terror. I mean, that's a really freaky story. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> or, you know, the, the, the duo <laughs> one of the and the, the one about the Maypole at Marymount. Yeah where it describes people wearing animal heads and Indians dancing around the maple. And then the response, which is Endicott and the Red Cross, when basically the green, the Puritan Green Berets come in and cut down the maypole and all this sort of stuff. Oh, that's fun. So get this. So in college, I was I took a class on the short story. In the last class, we had to come dressed in a costume as one of the characters from you did the maypole. No, I, I came as the minister with the black veil. Okay. <laughs> That's 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 awesome, and it's an awesome image that actually reverberates up through Lovecraft and others of this flickering veil in front of someone's face, and and what is or or isn't there. You know, there's lots of subgenres within horror, and one of the ones that's kind of it's only been named recently in a funny way, but I think it correctly names a strain that's always there. And I used the phrase before, folk horror. So Midsommar was sort of seen as that. Um, in retrospect, or Robert Egger's incredible film, The Witch, which yeah. was made around the same time we were making Salem. And it's just everything in some ways I would have wished we could have done, but because we were a more mainstream thing, we couldn't, but which really puts you in the mind and world of kind of Puritans in the in the deep, scary forest with, with possible uh, witches, but also films like The Wicker Man, um, yeah. stuff like that. The the original one or the or the the oh, TV remake? <laughs> yeah, for sure the for sure the original for sure the original. Or when did the remake come out? General, what's that? When did the remake come out? It's a good question. Not that long ago. Twelve oh, okay, years ago. So. Yeah, I like I a lot. It, and, and look, I'm not I'm not constitutionally against remakes. Hollywood, that we've always done that, and so do writers. I mean, I'm a less less an AI is involved. I'm I'm all for constantly yeah. revisioning, sure. and every generation needs it's the new ones and. Shakespeare is, yeah. I mean, half of Shakespeare are remakes of other plays or things he had heard about. So a remake can be okay. I'm just against really crappy ones. And that was yeah, a, crappy. a really crappy one. Yeah. But I, in a way, I would say that folk horror, that is that Protestant horror, because either it's the, because it's, again, you want know, to talk about the what's return of the repressed. You know, what is it that in particular got repressed? You know, in the Reformation was a lot of that old time religion, which both yep. on the one hand included all of this Catholic imagery of the body and blood and the woman and all of this stuff, but also all the folk practices that the church kind of capaciously allowed to penetrate into daily lives and tolerated at, at minimum to a much greater extent. And all the whole calendar, the whole ritual calendar of all these places, yeah. especially places like England and America, that were repressed from the more puritanical views of Protestantism. So it's not surprising that a lot of what I think, yeah, you are calling Protestant horror, or I would call folk horror, yeah. is about the idea of, huh, the minute you get out of the city, what you're going to find is people wearing animal heads and doing pagan things and pagan practices, whether or not you want to call that satanic or not, even with, even more so if you don't 
ascribe right. that to the devil in a more Catholic way, but it, it, to instead some kind of pagan resurgence, you know? Right. Well, that's what I love what you did in, in Salem with Tichaba. I mean, that's from the beginning, right? In the first episode. Then I, you know, it's like I had, you know, since being a kid and reading about the Salem witch trials and, you know, you recontextualized it for me. And, and, the, and the way, what you did, I mean, she's kind of representative of that kind of folk, I would even say Catholic Marian, you know, dark side in a way. Oh, yeah, say, and, yeah. and the witches in general are to some extent, we definitely, I kind of took, again, a very capacious view, a very Catholic and small C Catholic view of like sure. anything that we knew about mm -hmm. witches or that was thought about witches in the 17th century is, is alive within this. And part of what I did want to do was to, with all due respect to, to Arthur Miller and the, and, the, and, the, and the power of the crucible and to the fact that it's true that literally within years, not even decades of the events at Salem, the term witch hunt here in America first, but comes to mean a kind of ideological or uh, repressive hunt for an invisible and probably non-existent enemy. So that thought has always been there, but I did <laughs> want to recontextualize it in the idea of like, yeah, but this was not about believers and not believers. Like there's nobody right. uh, in North America in 1692 that doesn't actually believe in witches and all kinds of stuff. I mean, John Winthrop believes it and he's got all of John, he bought half of John Dee's library and put yeah. that in the basement of Harvard. I mean, every everybody from John Winthrop down to like a scullery maid or an indentured servant or even a slave all had completely beliefs like that. So the question was to go back to a phrase we used earlier, one of discernment. Yeah. Were, were, were they correct? And I was also trying to do a kind of post 9-11 rather than a post McCarthyist, you know, mm. uh, view of the, the Salem events and view it more in the way that one might look at some of the events that followed 9-11 of like, what if in the in, in the face of what might have been perceived as a real attack, then false enemies, you know, that were not necessarily what were the actual perpetrators were there. And so, the, you know, the core idea there, we can come back to teach about which was to me something we never got quite as far with in the show, uh, unfortunately, but it's, I'm glad that you saw and felt that. And there's a whole tradition there that I really is quite original to the show that based on my reading of, of all the documents from the Salem witch trials, that in fact, that woman she works for, who's both her friend and lover and et cetera, really does seem to have been the key to stuff. And she's never, she's barely mentioned in the records, but she's the one who recommends the witch cake. It's, they're clearly at the center of it. The thing about Tito about, yeah. about Tito also is that she's she's a, a South American Indian. She's probably Guyanese or something like that, or from certain, we're not sure where she would have from. And she would have come through the Caribbean where they were mixing Indian slaves and, and African slaves as they were shifting away from making indigenous South Americans into slaves, in part because it was too difficult and too yeah. violent. And they were finding it easier. It was a bigger market and they could already tap into the Arab market in, in African flesh, whatever. So I wanted to bring what are, in fact, South American traditions about the Kanema and the devil. And the, the this idea I wanted to play with in the show of like the American devil, a composite devil. Everybody came to this country and they brought their own devils. The melting pot the devil. Yeah. The melting pot devil, exactly. In fact, I'm working on another show now with two young Filipino American women from a podcast. They did about kind of the the interesting beliefs that that that, that they that come out of the Philippines, and that if you go to a bodega in a partly Filipino neighborhood, you will see all kinds of interesting magical artifacts. I've always been fascinated by that idea that if every kind of person from all over the world came to America, they all brought their gods and monsters with them. Yep. Sure. So what if we're also living around all of that? You know, it's not just the Indian graveyard. I mean, the whole damn country is an Indian graveyard. We know that. But also, there's all these things. But what I was going to say is the literally the sentence that sold that show to Fox was, I said, in Salem, the witches are real, but they're running the trials. Mm, okay. Because it was a whole scheme they had to be able to punish the Essex Puritans, who were the ones who were killing them back in the old country in England, in Essex. And they had found a way to do what they could never do before with their ceremonies by basically getting the Puritans to kill each other because they would be so panicked about who was a, who was a witch when none of those yeah, were yeah. witches. And that, that was sort of the, 
the there's a little bit of that theme in that is, Into the Woods. Nothing is more American than that, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> well, heck yeah. Adam, I think what you're doing, though, it makes me think there's kind of a shorthand I've put on this show a couple of times that, you know, I firmly believe this is only me as an individual that, like, um, what's kind of dying in the Catholic Church right now is about 500 years old. It's mostly centered in the North and West Europe. We have these Chestertonian five deaths and resurrections of the Catholic Church. But if the next one was going to be an American one, or maybe it'll be the one after that, um, it's going to be one that's peculiarly ours. I, I firmly believe it's going to be connected to the land and the body. But like your work and the use of horror, the shorthand I mentioned that I use a lot is our calling as American Catholics is to explore and baptize those things that are from below, but not of the devil. And that's a line I take from John Cowper Powis. And, uh, one of my uh, favorite writers, by the way. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, I mean, there's so much there. And uh, it seems to me that horror, is horror more popular in the U.S. to say, like, you know, the American land is inviting us to explore these dark things. And like you say, so many of these monsters, we, we if we find the courage to look at them, they're not quite what we think. You know, the, that's a theme. Is there anything you can say about that? Like, Well, I certainly think that the, if we talk about in terms of the genre of horror, it gets its first big boost I mean, there, look, there's always been great international horror. And in the era that we all grew up in, in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there's great Italian horror films and there's great oh, French yeah. horror films. Yeah. And in the 90s, the- What are the whole, themes that American horror works on uniquely well? Well, I think that's that's just it. I think you you pointed out, I do think if the peak of that sort of English horror was on the one hand, the conservative horror of the ghost story or the liberal horror of the monster, Dracula, you know, or the two well, faces of Jekyll and Hyde. Vampire movies, right? That's right. Yeah, I yeah. do think those are the classic, that's the inheritance we got. And I think in a lot, lot of ways, I, I would I would go exactly with what you're saying, Michael, in a funny way. That's the, I don't know what to call it. It's not, not the Protestantization of it, but the American Gothic, which then breeds American horror, is much more, and it's not that this doesn't exist in other countries, but it particularly picks up on strands that are about nature, that are about who and what was here before we got here, and what wow. did they leave behind. Mm -hmm. They're about the guilt of, the, 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 the combination of kind of ecstasy and guilt at being in a new world, but at the same time, feeling like you may have despoiled it as if you just invaded Eden and slaughtered yeah. whoever lived there. Wow. Um, you know what I mean? That there's yeah, yeah. great awareness of, I mean, you could see it equally, frankly, in, in something like the Western, one yeah. of the true genres that America does bequeath to the world, which is almost entirely filled with this kind of strange, ambivalent agony and ecstasy about the Indians, you know, whether they are, you know, and 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 our greatest heroes are ones like Hawkeye and others who've learned, or Daniel Boone, who've become quasi-Indian themselves yeah. in order to fight in a new way, while at the same time also imagining, you know, Scar, the, the fearsome Sioux leader or whoever, that is the ultimate devil in the in the woods. Yeah, I think folk horror in that sense, uh, in, well, everything that, that plays what you're saying. But I'm also really taken with that phrase you use about that. It's a wonderful image. This idea of yeah, not everything that's going to come up that way is the devil, and not everything we call or every not every entity we name the devil is the devil. And what right, is the right, devil? Right. And there's a yeah. lot else going on there. And particularly coming as I do also from a Jewish tradition where that figure is very different, as you know, and the, and the the places in the old, in the Bible, in the Torah, and in the Old Testament, um, where Satan or Satan, that, that, that figure appears, like in the book of Job, most significantly in others, is not at all yet imagined in the way that, that say, in the era of Paul, the devil will come to be imagined, and, and the demons will come to be understood, and then clearly there's other influences that pour into that, but it's a much more of a function from my own dim understandings that somehow within the Godhead itself, it's a member of the court. He's the word that I think in the Aramaic that's used there is a word basically that means prosecutor. The adversary. Yeah. The, adversary, yeah, the accuser. Yeah. The accuser, which is a part of a function with, with, with and within that. And yet most of the things we think about in relation to the demon world, I mean, certainly and Michael, you could probably speak to this better. There's, there's a lot of imagery in say the Kabbalistic side and the more mystical side of Judaism about kind of the world of the darker world of the invisible and what are those forces that are rooted, but are also each of which are could be mapped on parts of ourselves. Yeah. Right? You know, so there's a lot less, you know, it's more like as Pogo, one of the great philosophers of our era, the little possum in that comic book, say, yeah. you know, we've met the enemy and he is us. He is us. But yeah. it's the microcosm, it's the new, it's the higher 
it's the higher medieval worldview that our friend Michael's always going after, right? And instead of man as a microcosm, it's the same thing. But our bodies are a microcosm of the earth body. But right? it's, it's, so this, it's, this going to the depth of my psyche, we're going to meet the same things if we go to the underworld in the earth right, the with underworld. the Native Americans. Exactly, the underworld. And now here's the thing, right? So I haven't been thinking this way recently, but through the, That's a funny, like, lead through, through the deepest and darkest times of the pandemic. Yeah. I kept saying to my wife, I said, you know, is it even going to be possible to make horror films or science fiction after this? Is it even going to be possible? And and even more and more over that time, the, the thing that's really resonated with my, uh, my, my attempts to understand our times has been the Gnostic myth, right? Mm -hmm. Of the archons. That's a word I use a lot, right? You know, the the rulers of this world yeah which seem which is all it's kind of terrifying too right yeah. but but and, and the, the and the thing is is and all of these things when you talk about the ambiguity uh of uh you know coming into this land taking it and destroying people in you know the western but the, that ambiguity is the problem of evil right mm. What is evil? I mean, and the thing is, it's in a, as you point out, I mean, as you illustrate in in Salem, right? You know, like Cotton Mathers, right? Is he knows what evil is? It's those witches, but he doesn't know what evil is, right? And that's the th that's the thing with with uh, we see that in fundamentalism, left and right, right? Is, well, yeah, where in that sense, the enemy and, and even political literally. fundamentalism, yeah. right? Political and or religious of any, yeah. of any stripe. I mean, it doesn't matter. We can in the same way that I think everybody's sitting on this call is attracted to certain visible and invisible strands of almost every spiritual tradition and we recognize the commonalities within it and as bamford would have pointed us to all the time of like yeah. this is element that the sufis are talking about that's the same thing that the christian mystics are talking about that's the same thing that the rabbis are talking about versus we can all recognize that every one of those traditions also has an utterly literal minded i don't like the word fundamentalist because it's it's we could tend to apply it solely to one sect but every group has its equivalent of that where the danger is that is how it's literalized and therefore you know made monsters made metaphors into monsters as it were right you know uh and misses the the, the flesh that. but i gotta jump on and say that, which is the question you asked her michael about after you know after such knowledge what well, i mean after this experience can there still be horror films well no, there must be you know not only for the classic brechtian idea that you know in the dark times, what shall we sing of? You know, we shall sing of the dark times or whatever. What we'll, we'll make poems about the dark times. But for you and I, my own appetite for horror films was, during the during the lockdowns, especially. I was definitely not watching horror movies. I didn't want to watch Contagion or movies about this. I didn't yeah. want to watch any of that. But you know what? <laughs> my kids did. And in fact, the period since the lockdown has been one of those you can chart them throughout our history an explosion not only an explosion of horror films but of really good yeah. interesting ones by people who are two generations younger than us and whose audience is two generations right younger than us and it's a reminder i was saying before about that in lots of ways that we can all if we choose to kind of have some fun with and or learn things or enjoy some of those things but there really is something in them that is meant to speak to i don't want to say children though children get it in the form of fairy tales and other grotesque stories but to adolescents and young yeah. adults and people first emerging out of that one stage of life into another, they do need them more than ever. And they seek that they seek them out. And it's funny because we often falsely think, well, oh, well, so in bad times we get happy movies. Oh, in the depression, we just got musicals and, and screwball comedies. And it's like, no, that's also when you got Dracula, Frankenstein, and and the Wolfman. There. Yeah. And that's what in the American Nightmare, I'm sure. And that's also what was happening then, that at that moment. That's one of the ways we process and deal with it. Right. Know? So it's, it's interesting you say that because uh, I don't know if this is last year, two years ago, my two youngest, who are now 14 and 12, we found Soylent Green. <laughs> uh, I've still never seen it. I know the whole thing. Which, but... right. I hadn't seen since Spoiler alert, 14 it's 14 or 15. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in the beginning of the film, I was I was like, wow. It's like a modest it, proposal turns Well, forward. no, at the beginning of the film, even before the story starts, the kind of scrolling through backstory kinds of things, and everybody is wearing masks. 
Right. The year is 2022. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'd forgotten it take place. That was far thinking because usually you see movies from back then. It's like it's the future. It's 1990. Well, or, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, right? I think yeah, one of the but that messed me. That was like I'm done. Okay, I'm done. I don't want to see it. There's one other thing I do want to throw it just to bring it full circle also to what the question that you both asked and that uh, Michael Sauter you asked before about the relation of this to the Enlightenment. That it is it is worth thinking about also this side of it. There, there's no period of the hum, human imagination that doesn't, is not populated by monsters, right? So why is it, is, is the Cyclops section of the Odyssey a horror story? Is the Medusa a monster in that sense? Are those horror stories, are the Greek tragedies horror stories? And I say yes and no, mostly no, for this reason. They're not in, the, in our sense, precisely because they are pre-enlightenment in that sense. That what we think of as genre horror is a, is a specifically post-enlightenment phenomenon because there's always a moment in any, what we mean by horror, when one or more characters basically have to say, oh my God, can such things be? Right. How can this be? This seems to break the rules of the world. Somebody who lives forever and sucks blood, or this creature coming out of the sea, or whatever it is. But the one thing that like Odysseus and his men never say is, oh my, what, what, what? There's a giant with one eye in the middle? That can't That's be. a really good distinction. That yeah, breaks the rules important. of the world. So there is some kind of moment here where the, the rules of the world, and that brings it back to what I started with, that there's a moment when the rules of the world change and the aberrations within it can only be understood right. as horror. And yeah, that before yeah. that, they're there. And you can seek out the difference and in Salem, I encountered that because one of the things I quickly found was that there was a very different, countries had different attitudes towards their witches, for example. And you could see it, therefore, when there were witch panics about what did they do with them? Did they kill them? And particularly, it's surprise, surprise, the Germans and the English and then the Americans picking up that tradition. Um, and, and I wanted to see Salem not as its uniquely American phenomenon, but the last of a long European yeah, tradition. Yeah. The, the Germans and the English have an eliminationist view of the witch. And uh -huh. you can see it even in their fairy tales, you know, for the most part. Hansel and Gretel, what are you going to do with that damn witch? You better shove her head in the oven because she's yeah. going to eat you and kill you. But they're side by side. And Michael, I'd love to hear the sociological understanding of this. There is, for example, hugely the Russian vision of the witch, uh -huh. which is much closer to the visions of the witch you will see in the rest of the world. Well, the Yaga Yaga is yeah. very different. She is just as scary. And she may do things just as terrifying to you, including kill you or chop you up or eat you or put you in your pot and do it. But if you interact correctly with her, she may also save your life. You she know, may also lead you to the key to the golden feather or whatever. Yeah, I, I, well, think, I think it just occurred to me as you were talking about a connection between the Enlightenment and horror is that when you look at at least the European witch trials, you obviously know much more. Um, it's been noted, I forget the great historian, Norman O'Brown or somebody who wrote on oh, it. Oh, yeah, Norman but Cohen. Yeah. yeah, Norman Cohen. It's the, um, you know, it's the intellectuals that globbed onto it quickly, right? And well, so a new form of the intellectual post-enlightenment that they were hypersensitive to this and they were the leaders of these things, right? That's right. But the other side of that is, is how many of those horror stories post-enlightenment are, you know, feature a doctor or a scientist, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. you that's know? right. And, they, and they of course, then we get the mad scientist arising from that, right? Absolutely, absolutely, I mean, from the get-go. And certainly, yeah. you know, Frankenstein's so amazing for uh -huh. that reason, because it, it literally gives birth to simultaneously many different genres from our point of view of science fiction and horror and the mad scientist and the journal house of creation. And right. you got to remember that the genre distinctions between these is, is a very late and for the most part 20th century commercial distinction you know if you'd walked into a bookstore in hatchards in london and piccadilly and say 1901 and said hey I, I need a copy of dracula i need a copy of uh that sherlock holmes novel you know and i'd like to get a copy of frankenstein what section should i go to and they would have looked at you like fiction right you no know, okay. it would have been a mystery section or a horror section or those are kind of commercial distinctions yeah. that come later and so many of the fundamental texts of it uh precede that and don't have it. Wells is a great example. I mean, again, talk about the liberal horrors. I mean, that's the whole from, from you know, War of the Worlds through yeah. Dr. Moreau and vivisection is that. But I still want to throw it back to you, Michael Martin, about mm -hmm. is that is this example of the difference between like a Baba Yaga kind of figure versus, 
you know, the witch in Hansel and Gretel or the witch in England that has to be burned. Um, that to do with say, a different reaction to the to Sophia or to or to the feminine or to that's I think it's things well it's Catholic anxiety mm. right about the power of the Virgin Mary mm. which become which I, well, that's one of the one of the ways to look at it and in fact there's a really uh really fine short essay that David Bentley Hart wrote for First Things maybe tw 13 years ago um it was kind of a review essay of robert cook's kirk's uh, the secret commonwealth mm. and one of the things he proposed is, is one of the reasons for robert kirk to write that which was about fairies and witchcraft and stuff was to write it as a, a defense of the women who are being accused of witchcraft mm. uh in in scotland at the time right which was part of that and he 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 was a only he was a learned man but also he was a a, a a minister in a rural area so he was really in touch with those kind of folk traditions still and he was not antithetical to them did you really want like to say the, British, the divine like the virgin English mary book. though michael or like Pardon divine me? femininity you said the holy the power of the holy virgin mary well i i think are you do I you think, like that I usage of that see, phrase i think what you see in in the the protestant processing of that is that real anxiety well it's you can you can go freudian or you can go theological i guess i'm leaning in the context of horror a little more freudian you know just but i think i like that you can maybe you can't separate those that that's oh, right, right, right. i mean come on I mean, anxiety you, it's you know the thing is it yeah there's not uh, that much like bad, there's not that much distinction between yeah, it's a case that, point. and right. that could uh, i mean like a, oh wait but there's a vagina dentata there yeah the Freudians would say I was so, just I reading think... a, a book about a very controversial image of Our Lady of Guadalupe that came about 12 years ago uh -huh. there's a book on the reception of the image but it was a very voluptuous but it was yeah. not you know and good people were on both sides and I think this is what's going on you know again the American landmass is going to give I according to my theory is going to give a different image to divine femininity that... well, well I'm anticipating our next <laughs> next show but part of that I think you see that with uh, people using hallucinogens, right? Mm. Where the, the underworld, you, you the underworld, you can have a good trip or you can have a bad trip based that's on right. the same inner processing of images, right? That's exactly that's a perfect. That's a great. That's yeah, a perfect. just such a perfect example of that. Absolutely. So, and so to wrap up, because we, we could go on, I think, for a few more hours. It's a great conversation. <laughs> Holy crap! Yeah. But so here's my 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 quote. So Adam. Top three or top five or yeah, give it a go. Wow. I mean, that's a, that's an ever, of course, an ever, ever, ever shifting list. You uh, seem to be clued into us and our listeners. And so you can tailor it to that. <clears throat> one, since, you know, there's certainly a vibe here. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me think about it for a half a second. I, I guess if there were things I would want to point people towards, if they want to investigate more, um, let me do it this way without reducing to three films say to to three little kind of cups or different arenas to go examine if you haven't examined them if you haven't examined the last 10 years worth of this little mini renaissance we're in right now that would include this guy ari aster with those two films hereditary and and midsommar it would include on a very different level jordan peele and his get out and his sure. movie us Especially his movie Us in a way, which was very under. I'm sending theme. myself an email with these movie titles because I just don't know. Uh, okay. He is fantastic. Okay. Uh, there was a recent one last just last year called Barbarian that's all shot and takes place in Detroit, Michael. So oh, I really? really recommend that one. And it does definitely have to do with the the horror of the feminine in a lot of ways. Um, uh, I, I'd also mention. Who is that? that who is that third one? Uh, it, it's called Barbarian, and I don't remember the young writer director who did it. Okay. Um, but I throw in uh, the revolution of kind of more female driven, meaning by writer, female writer directors. There's a film called The Babadook from a few years ago by an Australian woman. And that one really goes How right. How is that spelled? B-A-B-A-D-O-O-K. Okay. And it's very much also about horror because it's about a children's book that terrorizes uh, a single mother and her child. But I would ask you to look particularly at how that horror film ends because it ends differently than any other horror film I can think. And it speaks directly to things that both Michaels here have very wisely pointed to of how one might turn or transform horror into something else by the time you get to the end of it. 
if there was another kind of capacious basket I would point towards, it would precisely be to look at non-American horror. I think a lot of our horror now was really particularly transformed by our discovery of Asian horror that goes all the way Parasite, back to yeah. Parasite, incredible. But even before that, even the more genre-driven ones like the original Ring, The Ring, Ringu, uh, a brilliant Korean film called A Tale of Two Sisters, um, and films by a guy named Kiyoshi Kurosawa, uh, like Cure and Kairos, actually we're literally using that resonant term, and some other amazing ones. So I would explore a bit in, because that's really revolutionized our, our way of telling them. And then I would say, don't forget the classics. And if there's one classic, if I just limit myself to one old classic, it would probably be to do, do homage to the ghost as a figure. It would be The Innocence, which was, I think, I think it's Jack Clayton. I forget the director. Um, his adaptation of Henry James, The Turn of the Screw, huh. starring Deborah Carr, and a film that's still to this day, even though it's black and white, even though there's no gore, even though nothing overtly, like we would think, horror is still is as beautiful and challenging a horror film as has ever been made wow, and does do true. taps into the whole Jamesian power of, is it psychic? Is it real? Is it women? Is it men? What is it? Wow. Great. This was uh wow. What a great conversation. No kidding. Total, <laughs> total mastery, mastery, total mastery of your subject matter. I'd put you up against <laughs> Milbank any day here. I mean, you're oh, both yeah. equally in command of your subject matter. That's the important <laughs> thing. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having me. It was really, it's a, Great to meet you, Michael. It's great to see you again, Michael, yeah, my right. brother from another mother. Uh, we're constantly discovering they the really mysterious are. lands that we have in common and are fascinated yeah. by. And I, I learn so much anytime I get a chance to talk to either of you. Let's do this again, Adam. I mean, you yeah. are uh, yeah. you're definitely a brother. Okay, thanks, everybody, for listening to the Regeneration Podcast. We're going to see you next week.